Now, brothers and sisters, as the priests leave, they're coming back. But uh, just sit down. I just want to prepare you for the Eucharistic healing service. And after the beautiful teaching of Father Pablo, but I think it's important just to say a few words and to share with you <clears throat> the power of prayer. And the question that I'm always asked is, does Jesus answer every prayer? Can you, what, uh, sometimes it doesn't happen the way you expect. Uh, some people say to me, you know, well, I didn't get my answer because I had to go to the doctor and I have to take medicine and I have to have an operation and uh, the miracle didn't happen. But you know, brothers and sisters, when he was speaking, Father was speaking about freedom tonight and about Jesus, the only one who is the truth. One of the great lessons I learned over these 50 years of ministry is that living is a school of learning. You know, in the very beginning when I began this ministry, I went to Mother Angelica. Many of you have heard of her. She's deceased now, but she was the founder of the cable TV EWTN. But I knew her 50 years ago, before she had any TV, with only about six nuns. And she was beginning her ministry in Alabama. And she, she was very creative because you know she sold, she made fish and bait, she sold peanuts, she did everything to make money for this monastery and for the work God was calling her to. She had a very creative mind. But I went there to make a, a retreat and really to pray in this ministry that the Lord would, you know, help me. And I knew all these very famous people who had great gifts. And I thought, well, I'll read these books, you know, of Mike Scanlon and Barbara Stephen, different authors that might give me some help. How foolish. So when I went there, Mother Angelica said to me, um, I was in the chapel in adoration with all my books. And she said, you know, she had the funniest voice. She says, what are you doing? And I said, well, Mother, it's like a job. If you're in a job, you have to know what to do. I said, I have an idea about a healing ministry and what Jesus is asking. And she said, you don't need to know. And then she looked at the book. She says, get rid of those. And she brought me up in front of the monster and she says, that's the teacher. He, you don't learn styles. You don't copy styles of people. Go to the source, which is Jesus, who's the truth. And it honestly, for these years, how true, because it is a school of learning for me. And I'm going to tell you three different ways, just to encourage you, that Jesus heals and that miracles happen that I've seen and how he taught me. And how he showed me that, you know, in the most extraordinary he teaches you through every healing. The Lord has shown me that there's no difference in the stories in the gospel because the Jesus of the gospel is the Jesus here today. And the first thing I'm going to tell you is about myself because it's rather humorous. Some of you have heard it. You know that I was physically healed of the rheumatoid arthritis when I was a young nun. And I was very blessed because I was, you know, in Musgrove Park Hospital in Belfast and I had casts on my feet and I spent a lot of time in pain, went to America, had lots of drugs that they gave me for experimenting on new medication, and nothing helped uh, to a degree. It, you get, you know, it didn't bring me, it, certainly that I was going to be able to walk eventually. And then Jesus, who is the truth and who can do the impossible, I have no, I, I had no idea why he healed me because I didn't ask for healing. I asked for to love him, to fall in love with him, to, to have that certainty that Father Pablo spoke about. You know, I always say to, to priests and, and when I'm giving the retreats and I say it to the sisters, I say it to people who teach the faith, you know, and whatever you are, teachers, or that the one thing that is needed is certainty, that we know and are convinced of what we teach. Because if you don't, you'll never, you'll never pass it on. And I was thinking as a young nun of 23, you know, I knew the convent so young in my teens, you know, wouldn't it be foolish to spend your whole life in the convent and not, first of all, be in love with Jesus and not be totally convinced 
that it's a vocation, a gift, and my vocation is not mine. Jesus, give it to me. I can't brag, you know, that I entered the convent so young. I mean a thing. Jesus, give me the gift, but what I do with the gift is my gift to him, and that's the same with you in your marriage, in your, whether you're single, whatever vocation, and as religious as a priest. Anyway, I had great, and I have good help, but I got something that I never expected happened to me. One morning, I woke up with a terrible wink in my eye, and I couldn't stop winking. And I work with clergy men all the time, you know. So here I am, winking at them. And, you know, it, it, I did everything I could. I prayed. I got people to pray with me. It would go away for about a, maybe two weeks, and I'd be saying, oh, thank you, Jesus, I'm healed. Back it would come worse. And this went on, and, you know, people say, claim your healing, and, you know... Uh, believe it's going to happen. Well, you know, you can believe until you're blue in the face, but it didn't happen. I was getting worse and my, I was winking. So after, can you imagine, I prayed for an eight to nine years and it would, you know, it would stop, it would start, it would stop, it would stop and it's very irritating. And so one day I went, I was in Germany giving a priest retreat and my eye was own furious. It was winking all the time. They're looking at me, you know. And anyway, I came home and I went into the chapel and I thought, I just, I've, I'm praying and praying and praying. So as, as a mother or a father would say to their child, I said to Jesus, I have to have a serious talk with you, Lord, because this is really getting on my nerves. And the doctor would tell me, well, it's too much caffeine. You know, the Irish, we love tea. And I not only love tea, but I like coffee as well. So I had both. So it's too much caffeine. Or maybe somebody in your family has a nerve. So one day I went into the chapel. And you know, I'm telling you this, because for me, this was a great school of learning. I go in and I said to Jesus, look, Jesus, I am fed up with this eye. Now, there's three things I'm going to beg you for. The first, now, and I can't be that big of a miracle that you can't heal, give me a miracle for my eye if you give it to me for my feet, my hands. I said, geez, couldn't you give me a miracle? Please heal whatever's the source of the problem with this eye. If that's not your will, then couldn't you send me a doctor? I mean, there must be some doctor not just looking at me, but be able to tell me what's wrong with me or get me help. And if that's not your will, then I need supernatural grace to offer it up. You know, people say to you, when you're in the throes of despair or depression or have pain or some people, so you have to offer it up. Easier said than done, right? So, but I said, you can't do it without grace. It's impossible. It's suffering without Jesus. And you don't have to feel, you know, you like people say, oh, I have to accept this God's will. No, tell him. I used to tell him. Look, God, it might be your will, but I'd far rather it wasn't, because I'd like to get healed. When I'd finished the last one, a voice spoke to me from the monstrance, clear, and I heard, go see a neurologist. So I thought, okay, where did it come from? It had to come from Jesus, because I wasn't even thinking. Go see a neurologist. So I left the chapel and I met a little sister on the way out and she said to me, where are you going, Breach? I said, I'm going to see a neurologist. She said, oh, who told you? I said, Jesus, after telling me. So one of my st former students of past, last century said to me, she's a doctor, and I was telling Tracy and she said, oh, I'll get you a neurologist because it's not easy to get in, you know, so fast. So I go to see this neurologist and the first thing she said to me when she looked at me, now I wasn't dressed in my habit, I went civilians, she didn't know I was a nun, I thought I'd just go incognito as we say. So and she's looking at me and she said, I think I know what's wrong with you. And I said, well, can you fix me? Well, she said, we'll take an, R an MRA and an MRI, as those of you in the medical profession would know, and um, come back in two days. So she brought me in and got me 
right away in to get these x-rays. So two days later, I go back, and Father Kevin, my co-worker at the time, and Jackie were with me, the sec my secretary, for years. And um, so I go in, and she looked at me, and she said to me, Sister, then she, I think she knew by then I was a nun. She said, Sister, are you in, me in the medical profession? I said, no. Well, she said, are you a doctor by any chance? I said, no. And she went on questioning me, like, what I knew about medicine. So then she said to me, but sister, how did you know to come to me? I mean, who told you to come to me? So I looked at her and I said, well, actually, Jesus told me. She said, Jesus told you about me? And she got all excited. And she said, does Jesus know me? I said, I hope he knows you. So, oh, she was so excited. It was about 34, 35. I said, of course he knows you. So she said, well, there's two cures. There's a, a temporary and a permanent. So I said to her, well, what's the temporary? She said, Botox. <laughs> now, I know, I didn't know then. The only thing I knew about Botox when I was talking to her was that all people, women go in there, movie stars and you know some of them look terrible i mean they've changed their mouth face and everything and, oh god botox and it costs as they say an, an arm and a leg and i thought to myself i said oh goodness botox i'm a nun my mother superior if i told her a thousand dollars a month or something I'd say, but now i know later that botox is used in different medical procedures you know it's not always for to make you look younger looking to change your face but I said, oh, no, I couldn't have that. I said, what's the permanent? And she said, brain surgery. So I said, OK, I'll have the brain surgery. But what's wrong with me? <laughs> and she said, um, oh, you, the brain surgery. Would you pick the brain surgery? And I'm thinking, well, if Jesus told me from the monsters to come and see you, and I was to go see a neurologist, then it's up to him. If I die, it's his fault. So. I said, yes, I'll have the brain surgery, but tell me what's wrong with me. And for the medical people here, I'm sure there are, she, you would know. She said to me, well, she said, I couldn't pronounce the word, but she said, inside your brain, a blood vessel and a nerve have fused, okay? And every time the blood vessel pulsates, it cut, hit the nerve, you know, and the skin of the nerve. And she said, it's, it's not now, it's a very delicate operation, she said, but she's, uh, what the, will do, the surgeon will do is he will cut out a bone out of the back of your head, first thing. Then he will cut inside into the brain and he will separate the nerve from the blood vessel. Can you imagine how delicate this is? And then he will surround the nerve with titanium to keep it from being affected by the pulsating of the blood. So I'm listening to this as if she was telling me it's a lovely day. <laughs> I said to her, fine, when can I have the operation? And you know, to tell you all the things, which is true, to tell you, you know, how serious it is, just think one nick of that knife and what would happen to you. So I said to her, oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm pretty convinced that if God asked me to do this, so when I came out, I met dear Father Kevin, who was, you know, from Fermanagh, and uh, we were together for many years working in, across the world. So he said to me, did you get any, what did they tell you? I said, I'm going to have brain surgery. And his response was, are you mad in the head? You're going to have brain surgery. I said, yeah, I'm going to have brain surgery. Oh, so there were, everybody thought I was going to die that knew about it. He said, anyway, brothers and sisters, I went to Shan's Hospital in Florida big hospital for brain damage and surgery. <clears throat> and I, when I was there, I was all prepared. And the doctor um, they got me ready. I don't know how long I was in surgery. But when I came out, all I remember is the nurse saying to me that was in the recovery room, what's your name? And I am totally distracted because I'm looking at the ceiling. And on the ceiling is this beautiful painting. And written in colored writing was, Miracles Do Happen, Just Believe, the title of my book. 
And I said to her, I thought I was having a vision. I said, is there something written there? And she said, oh, yes. You're not supposed to be in this room. This is a children's room, recovery room. But she said, that was written by a family whose little boy was, had a great healing. Well, I was there two days. I got home. The wink was gone. And, you know, you ask yourself, you know, now, it would have been much cheaper to have a miracle, I'll tell you, because medicine isn't cheap. But why would God? I mean, I prayed, and I prayed for nearly 10 years. Why do you think God allowed all of that and to go on? Do you know what I learned through that? that medicine and doctors are a gift of God. That one of the biggest errors that people make is that they think, well, if I have to have an operation, God didn't answer my prayer. Or people say to me, sister, I don't go to the doctors, I don't believe in the doctors, I go directly to Jesus. And I think, what an insult to the Lord. Because you know, I think of those of you in this church tonight who are medical people. It is the most powerful gift because, yes, you financially are supposed to make a living like any other, but you're not dealing with animals or with cars or with gadgets. You're dealing with human beings who one day, as a doctor or a nurse or a healthcare person, you will stand before the Lord and you'll hear those words, what you did for that person, you did for me. Because Medicine is the part of Jesus' healing ministry. He uses the medical profession. He uses medication. He uses treatment. All is part of what he allowed, even in the pagan world, even where people don't know Jesus. He is working through the skills and knowledge he gives to medical people. And this is why I'd say that probably... The, the, the Satan goes out after medical people as he does the clergy because there's such a, an extraordinary ministry. Why? Because today, brothers and sisters, how horrible. I've spoken to medical people in different parts of the world and I've seen and heard how terrible when, when a doctor or, or any medical person misuses their skills because they're God's gift to them to kill, to abort to euthanize, to change the sex of children, which is happening today, to mutilize little children, to do the things that they're doing, which is going to be on their judgment. And that's why I'd say to you tonight, when I'm, we're going to be praying for healing. We're going to pray for medical people as well, because it's a beautiful, anointed gift. And a doctor, a, a, an Irish doctor who was a surgeon in Canada used to say to me, great man. In fact, he was in standby for when Pope John Paul was, was shot that time. He, he was very well known in, in part where he worked in, in Canada by a lot of Italians, a lot of people went to him. And do you know what made the difference? Joe, his name was Dr. Joe. He was a great Catholic man. Uh, but he, he said to me, you know, or I asked him to speak to a group of clergy. I was speaking in, in, in a conference for priests. For priests and I, I asked Joe would he talk. And he said that every week, at the beginning of the week, he would make the stations of the cross and he'd walk around the stations and he'd say, in an hour, I'm going to be down in that surgery and I'm going to have, how am I going to treat the body of the person? What, what, how will I, I treat that person? So that's the first, and I never, I never doubted that the Lord allowed me to have to go to the surgery to teach me that he has many ways of healing. The second one, is beautiful because it's it's people say you know that i about answered prayer does god answer prayer you know brothers and sisters i had the most dramatic experience of healing in australia <clears throat> when a sister a nun who had no muscles she she had deformity in her esophagus and the the muscles she couldn't um, swallow food she was 50 years of age, a lovely person who was working on a retreat in Sydney with that, with Father Kevin and myself. And she never eats. She was always drinking liquids. And I said one day to her, Sister Margaret, how come you, you make a beautiful dinner for me at the convent, but you never eat? And she said, Bridge, I can't swallow. I have to get my food liquidized. 
And I spontaneously said to her, did you ever ask Jesus to heal you? And she looked at me as if I was simple, and she said, I was born this way. It, I, there's nothing they can do. It was only seven years ago that we thought, I thought it was a bad stomach because I was always throwing up. But they discovered that my, it was here, that it wouldn't go down, it would, the food would, would come up again. So I said to her, Margaret, you go to Mass every day, you meet Jesus. I said, you know, you should really ask him to, to heal you. People would say, well, you know, like she said, she said, you know, Bridge, I'm not sick because, you know, I can swallow all this, this liquid and it keeps me healthy. And I'm looking at her and I'm thinking, can you imagine never being able to eat? Did you have to swallow your whole life of liquid? So I said to Margaret, you're not doing God a favor. Never be afraid to ask for the impossible because you give Jesus an opportunity to show that he can do the miraculous. So she, she, all she did was laugh at me and say, oh, I wish I had my fa faith like you, Breach. Well, anyway, after the third time I was talking to her at one of the retreats, I said, Margaret, how are you doing? Did you ask Jesus? And she said to me one day, she said, you know, I'm making a retreat next week with you in Brisbane. She said, and you have convinced me that I should, I should really pray for, for healing. Now, she came on the retreat, and when we had, it was for a group of sisters, and when the anointing of the sick was for the sick, I said to her, you should get anointed, and she says, she's like taking about 30 pills as well a day, but she said, I'm not sick. Oh my God, not sick, you can't eat. So she goes up, and Father uh, Kevin anoints her, and she also receives the Eucharist, Two days after the retreat ended, she went back to Sydney. And this is how God works. Now, this is extraordinary, but this is the power that's right for us tonight with Jesus. She goes back to our convent. And you know, the beautiful thing about the Lord is he works in very ordinary ways. He puts ideas into her heads. He'll give us the prompting. Because she said to me, leaving the retreat, because she really prayed hard in this retreat, how will I know if I'm healed? Because if I eat, I choke. I said, don't, he'll tell you. She goes back to the convent and she takes out the blender and she's going to liquidize her food. And you know what happened to her? She got a longing for a lamb chop. <laughs> and she thought, I've never had a lamb chop. So she goes to the fridge, none of the nuns home, they're all away in halls. So she said, I am really going to try. She, your mouth was watering for a lamb chop. And she said, so I put the lamb chop, got it defrost, I made a lovely dinner of potatoes, carrots, and anything hard I could get. And I sat down and I said, listen, Jesus, I don't know that I'm going to die or not, but I'm going to enjoy this lamb chop. <laughs> well, you know, she was a little bit disappointed because she didn't, she felt good. And it all went down and it stayed down. So she waited two days and she called us, we were given a parish mission in Sydney, and she said to the parish priest who knew her, a Dominican, she said, you know, Father, I don't know if I'm imagining, but I really feel wonderful. I've eaten, I had, I had cereal for my breakfast, and I had this lamb chop, and, I, and she said, I'm really feeling wonderful. So she, the, the priest said to her, Mark, go and see the doctor. The doctor, you might need the doctor, but he might need you. Go and see him. So she goes to see the doctor. Now the doctor said to her, oh, it's your adrenaline, and maybe you're excited. And he was a kind of putting her off. And he said, come back to me in a week. Margaret went back in a week and she had put on pounds. Because she ate everything she could get to prove. And she kept thinking, I think I'll try this, I'll try this. She goes back and the next week he says to her, well, would you go to the specialist? That there was a specialist in Sydney who actually discovered and diagnosed her problem with the x-rays of the formity in, in this part of her anatomy. So, oh, she said you couldn't get into him for six or seven months. Oh, he said, no, I'll make an appointment. He'll get in this week. So Margaret said she went, to, went in, and they brought her in, and the specialist, who had all her x-rays from seven years before, said to her, so you think you're healed, do you? And she said, well, it's not about thinking. Something has happened to me. 
So he said, well, I'll do the tests, but they're very uncomfortable and, you know, put the balloon down and all. And then he, when he'd finished them, he said, go out and wait, uh, Sister Margaret, in the waiting room. And about 15 minutes later, a little man came out crying for the attendant, you know, and everybody thought Margaret was hearing bad news because he was weeping. And he said, come in, it's a miracle. She goes in and the doctor, the specialist looked at her and he said, I would not believe it, but I've proof. And he held up the two x-rays to her, one with a brand new set of muscles. Perfect. And she said, he said to her, who prayed with you? She said, Jesus. But he said, go home because I know that this is not possible in the medical profession. We can't disprove. Because there's times that people, medicine does, like it did with me, I got healed, but it wasn't like the miracle, the operation healing. There are other ways of chemotherapy. Miracles happen through the skills of the doctor, but this was a pure miracle. Margaret came over here to Ireland, but when she went home, she said, the young people, she worked with, with youth as well, they were so overcome that she told this. So I had made her a promise. I, I told her when I was leaving, you know, I said, before she was healed, I said, Margaret, she was going to Rome for a sabbatical, and I was going to be in Rome speaking. So I said to her, Margaret, when you come to Rome, this is me trying to get her to ask to be healed. I said, I know a lovely restaurant, Italian restaurant, and I'll treat you to dinner. So she kept me to it. And she went to Rome. And we met the famous author, John Cornwell, who wrote the book about the Pope's death, you know, John Paul I. And he, he worked for the Sunday Times, I think. He was an editor of the Sunday Times. And he, he said to me, when he was talking to me, and I was telling him, he said, it's very hard to believe it. I said, you come to dinner with me and meet her. And there, she put, he, he was trying to say to her, is it possible? She pulled out the two x-rays and she showed them. And she said, here. And he couldn't believe it. And see, I'm telling you this, brothers and sisters, this is only one of many, that God does have the power to do the impossible, but we don't believe it. And it's hard. His father said, yes, you can doubt. I doubt. I prayed with a woman one time with no eyes, and I thought, oh, this is impossible. She lost her eyes in a car crash, and she got her sight. It wasn't my faith, because I was looking at her and saying, this is impossible. But I prayed. And see, faith is not a feeling. I don't always feel. And the last thing I'm going to tell you is, tonight when Jesus is walking around, uh, you know, he will be looking at you. And you know, we, the, one of the touching miracles that I saw was a, a young couple who came with their little daughter. And she was in a little, little uh, go-kart, you know, and a beautiful little girl. But he, before the healing service and before we started, they, they pulled the, the cover off her feet. And she was born with both club, completely clubbed feet. And the husband said to me, he said, you know, we have prayed and prayed. And tonight we're coming to beg that we be able to get medical help at this early age, you know, for her. Now, the miracle happened in this way. That night, he prayed to God for a miracle. The next day he goes to his office, he was a lawyer, and his law partner said to him, Jim, you were telling me that you have a little child with his very bad feet. He said, you know, I was given a card to give to you of a doctor that's a foot specialist, and he's brilliant at reconstructing feet. And so he said, I'm going to, I'll get the card and give it to you. Two years later, we were back in that parish, or three years later, and that little girl was walking. She could complete reconstruction of her feet. And I realized that it happened that, that night when they prayed. But I also saw a little blind girl heal physically. I've seen cancer. I've seen people with, with terrible, terrible discouragement, depression, anxiety. A child came who had epileptic fits nine, 10, 20 times a day. And he heard us at the healing service. And when Jesus was passing by, the little boy stood up and he, he was, wanted to play football. He wanted to do it. He couldn't do it because of this epilepsy that he was having all the time. And 
I was saying is I'd say to you, look at, you ask Jesus, and this little boy, you know, children are like sponges. He believed. So he, in front of me, he begged Jesus, said, Jesus, I really want to get healed. I don't want any more shots. I don't want. So the next day he was going to school and the mother was giving him the medicine and he looks at her and says, Mommy, I don't want it. I'm not taking it. She said, you have to take it. She told me herself. She said, you're not going to be able to go to school if you don't take the medicine. But he said, last night, Mommy, when Jesus was going through the church, I asked Jesus and he told me, I'm healed. And she fought with him. And finally, he wouldn't give in. And she came to see me six years later. She said, Sister Breach, he never had another attack from that night. That's the power of prayer. So let's pray tonight. Father's going to put out the monster, the, the ho sacred host. In the, and this is Jesus. He's a person. Don't worry. It's not a feeling. But whatever you have come for. And those of you who are looking, I know a friend of mine in Boston is looking. She's looked at all the mission, Annie. But for all of you are looking on, when we're praying with the sacred host, Jesus will not limited to this church. We will pray for you wherever you are uh, tonight for the healing service. And we'll ask Jesus. And miracles can happen in different ways. So let's prepare now for the Jesus. And while Father, the, the, the beautiful choir, thank you so much, they will uh, have an opening hymn, and then I will sit up here and I will pray. There'll be no music. Father will walk through the church. And as he's walking to bless you with Jesus and allow Jesus to touch you, I'll be praying here with you with all the intentions that you're asking for. So let's prepare now for the Eucharistic adoration and the, the healing service. Now, as Father prepares, you can sit up if you feel more comfortable sitting up and just, but look at the host and pray. This is your opportunity as Jesus is going around the church to really pray and intercede for your family and all those you love. And as Father comes to where you are, look at Jesus and just make acts of faith, of love, intercession, and he will be listening. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Jesus. I thank you for coming tonight. Jesus, we come to you because we believe. This is one certainty. It was you, Lord, who said, I am the bread of life. You said, he who comes to me will never be disappointed. You would never turn away any of us who come, Lord. Even with a little tiny faith, you keep telling us we could move mountains to believe. Jesus, I beg you, tonight to, as you walk through this church. Please, Lord, let your power flow to every person. I pray that you lay your healing hand upon your people here. Jesus, please open our eyes to see. When Bartimaeus cried out to you, Jesus, I want to see, the first thing that happened was 
that you, you, Lord, came, you opened his eyes, he could see you. Tonight we want to see you, Lord, with the eyes of faith. I pray that you take away moral and spiritual blindness. So often, Lord, we are completely in the dark because we have not talked to you. We don't know you. Jesus, tonight I beg you to heal our ears, that we may hear you. Lord, in a world of noise, in a world where people are turning away from you, a world, Lord Jesus, that no longer acknowledges you, we tonight ask you, speak to us, Lord. Guide us with the truth. Bless us, Lord, that we may know and discern what is truth. You are truth. I ask you, Jesus, to touch our lips, our voice, that we will never, Lord, deny you, that we will proclaim you, Lord, certain and true, knowing that you are the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus, so many people use your name in vain. So many people use it in a mocking way. Lord, heal our speech, that as followers of yours, and as men and women, young people, who receive your precious body and blood, Lord, that our lips, our mouth, will never defile or destroy the great gift you have given to us in our faith. I pray tonight, Lord, for, the, for every person here, especially for the beautiful gift, Lord, of faith. Increase our faith tonight. Please help us, Jesus, to believe. We doubt. At times it's difficult. I pray, Lord, that you would give to your people here the gift of faith. I pray that you, Lord Jesus, will touch and heal our hearts. Lord, we know nothing is impossible with you. And I pray this night, Lord, that for the human heart is the greatest gift where you want to be and make your home. Heal us of hurts, of hardness, of unforgiveness. Heal us of any medical problems in the human heart. Lord, heal in the ways that you see. And I pray tonight, Jesus, and I ask you to please let your healing power flow through every part of all these little children. Lord, tonight as you walk through this church, we pray, I pray, Lord, for all those who are sick physically, especially, Lord, any person here from man, woman, or child that is suffering from some physical disease or some mental problem, Whatever it is, Lord, I pray especially for a great healing. Jesus, you want us to ask for the impossible. I pray for the many, many that I've met, Lord, since I came here, who are suffering from cancer, who have to go for surgery, for those people suffering from anxiety and depression, for those people, Lord, who have mental anguish, bipolar, schizophrenic, all these are real sicknesses that only you, Jesus, through your power can heal. And I beg you for a miracle for these little children. I pray, Lord, tonight also for those who have asked me to pray who are facing surgery or have great pain, who are afraid how much the enemy wants us to be fearful, to be nervous, to be anxious. And you kept saying, put your trust in me. Jesus, I pray this night that you will give to every person in the church the healing they have come for according to your plan. Take away, Lord, especially from those who have great pain. Take away, Lord, if it is you will, the suffering. You want us to ask to be freed from the pain, the suffering, the fears, the anxieties. I beg you, as you gazed at the people in the gospel, when you looked at the woman, Jesus, who was hemorrhaging, you looked at her and said, who touched me? She just believed if she could touch you. We believe, Jesus. Lord, you looked at Bartimaeus and you said, because of your faith, you will be healed. You saw the mother weeping for her son and you give him new life. Lord, tonight I pray for all those who have lost loved ones, for those, Lord, who are in hospital or many of our families who have chronic sicknesses or diseases. Jesus, have mercy on us. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, touch them. I pray also tonight, Lord, for all families. Jesus, I beg you, 
to please walk into the homes of every person in the church here, especially to bless and renew the sacrament of matrimony. So many people offend you, Jesus, by not even inviting you into, the, into this unity of marriage. I pray for these young couples, Lord, that they will discover that the greatest freedom, joy, peace is to invite you through this beautiful sacrament. I pray, Lord, for those who have marriages that are abusive. I pray, please, Lord, we know that no marriage that is abusive is really your will. Because, Jesus, this is a beautiful gift. And you call them to love one another, to become one in you and for you and with you. I pray for every couple here in the church. And I pray especially for the, the parents and grandparents of children that you will give them great faith, great hope. I pray for the many members of our families who have lost the faith, who have turned, Lord, in any way to addictions. <clears throat> I pray especially for those who have lived and many, many people we know who have lived criminal lives, who have been, Lord, affected by the troubles, who have been, Lord, living in a way that is contrary to you. Jesus, please give them peace of mind. You're a God of mercy. You're a God of forgiveness. I beg you, Lord, tonight, the many who came to me in these weeks of parish missions across this country and England, have told me but their children have been on drugs, imprisoned, in doing things that cause them to lose freedom. Please, Jesus, you know, have mercy on them. I pray tonight also, Lord, for those people watching over the, it, the website or live stream, whatever they are, I pray, Lord, for every one of them in the homes that have this, this night joined us here. And I ask you to walk into the lives of these people in their homes. Lay your healing hand upon them. And tonight I also pray, Lord, for this parish here and for the parishioners here. Jesus, I thank you. And I pray that this parish will be renewed. Many great graces will be poured out upon them. I pray for the schools, for their teachers. I pray, Lord, for all of the people, as Father called out, who participated for this beautiful choir for their families, because saying yes to serve others is such a blessing. Bless them tonight, all who participate. And Jesus, I ask you, I ask you tonight to bless our priests here, to bless Father Peter and Father Michael, to bless the deacons and all the communion serves, all, Lord, the men and women who how much you love them for saying yes to serve you through their ministry here at the church. And I pray tonight, Jesus, in thanksgiving for all the ways that you have blessed us during these days. Jesus, please tonight, heal those who've been waiting. Heal those, Lord, who are troubled. And I ask you especially for the many, many young couples that I know who have asked me to pray that they can have a little baby, that they can conceive, that the beautiful gift of human life, which is such a gift, I pray, Lord, for those couples. And I pray tonight for, Lord, I beg you, please protect our country from the horrors of abortion. I pray especially tonight for those who have suffered this way. Forgive them, have mercy on them. And I ask you to please grant them healing. And you know, as I pray this, I say to you, you know, I was in the Czech Republic and this just came to me so powerfully. While I was visiting a big shrine, there was a man there taking care of the shrine in the Czech Republic and I went to see the shrine of Our Lady. And he was under communist rule for many years and his wife and himself didn't want a little girl they had, so they aborted it. And when they got the freedom, and they encountered Jesus. They, they had a great conversion. But he took a job at the shrine, which is a shrine honoring Our Lady because somebody went there who was in labor and on the side of the road. And this little shrine, she had a great uh, delivery and saved the baby. And they were a noble family. So it's a big shrine. 
So he went there to work in Thanksgiving because his wife had a little baby when they discovered abortion is terrible. They shouldn't have done it. They were totally ignorant and, and made, said, didn't realize what they were doing. The little girl was six and she came to work with her father. He was at work. And while she was looking at her lady and playing around, she came over to the father and she said to him, this was two days before the referendum in Ireland and she, he was praying for Ireland. He told me, the little girl came in and she said, Daddy, I met my little sister. And he said, well, you don't have a sister. She said, yes, I do. Because she came from heaven and she said to me, I'm your sister, but I'm in heaven. Because mommy and daddy didn't realize and they didn't keep me. And he said, my God, this child told him. And you know, when I heard that, and he said, I'm begging for Ireland. Because it, 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 what a horrible thing. Now I realize and I'd say to you tonight, as Jesus is walking around, I beg you, pray, pray, because the most horrible offense against God is to take the beautiful gift of life. I pray for all medical people. I pray tonight, Jesus, for every doctor, every nurse, every care person who cares for the elderly, the mentally, the physically handicapped. I beg you to give these men and women such a disdain for the destruction of human life that they will never ever participate. Lord, I pray in thanksgiving for the medical profession, for the miracles of grace and release of pain and healing that takes place in our hospitals. But Lord, I plead also that these places will not become places of death. I pray for the elderly in our country and for all of us at this time of our lives. Lord, give us a great grace to not see the elderly as a burden but as a gift, Lord. I pray also tonight, and I ask you, Lord, to give to all parents a deep awareness of the gift of family. Heal these families, Lord. Touch them with your power. Unite them, Lord. I pray for those who have left the Catholic Church, who no longer believe in the fullness of truth, Lord, or believe anything but what the world tells them. Re Tonight, I pray for my own family, members who don't practice, who, don't, who refuse to receive you, Jesus, the bread of life. And I ask you for every family here who has people in their families who are gone, lapsed, and who don't come to church. Lord, say your word over them. Jesus, I believe in you. I love you, Jesus, and I pray for them. Pray for all of us, Jesus, here tonight that I beg you to heal them. And tonight, I pray for the church, Lord. I pray for the church here in Ireland, for our own Diocese of Armagh, with the Archbishop, the Bishop, and all the priests and bishops of Ireland. Lord, we know that there is, the, the flame is there with Patrick's let the fire. We pray tonight for a rekindling of that flame of faith. I beg you, Lord, that you bless the Bishop's Conference, that you bless, Lord, the priests and bishops and sisters, brothers, religious in Ireland, that we will never, Lord, forget that our mission is to preach you the way, the truth, and the life. Please, Lord, renew the church. I pray for Pope Francis and all of the cardinals and bishops of the world. Please, Lord, give to our church unity. Give to our church, make us a great light, Lord, at a time when so many are suffering, so many of our brothers and sisters in many parts of the world, and especially for their Catholic faith. I pray, Lord, for the please tonight, the places of war, of famine, of terrible persecution. I ask you through our prayers to grant, Lord Jesus, a miracle of peace. I pray for Ireland. <clears throat> we pray, Lord, especially here in, in, in our part of the island, we pray, Lord, that this, this government will work, Lord. I pray that you would raise up honest and good people who think of the welfare of your children. And I pray for both the whole island that you, Lord, would please visit it again. We beg you, St. Patrick and St. Bridget, with our blessed mother, the Queen of Ireland, we ask you to intercede here in the presence of Jesus tonight for all those who work in public office, for all those who hold jobs which affect the running of this country and this nation. 
I pray for them because you told us to ask. So even though we may be a few among the millions, we know, Jesus, that the power is not in numbers but in faith. So I pray and I beg you, Lord, for world peace. I ask you, Mary, our mother, Queen of Ireland, intercede for all of us. Pray for us, Mary, that just as you came to knock to show us the power of our Catholic faith, we pray through the intercession of St. Joseph, who is with you and is here tonight. We pray through the intercession of all the holy martyrs and saints of Ireland. We pray also to you, Mary, Queen and Mother of Ireland. Please visit us. Give us an experience again of renewal. And I ask all of this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> and I just ask you for a moment just to look at this sacred host. And remember, brothers and sisters, I beg you, don't just come to the church tonight for the mission. You know, please come to Sunday Mass. It is your salvation. And the Catholic Church doesn't force you to go to Mass. It, may, it is an obligation. It's a sin not to go to Mass. But that's because this, this mother, the church, so much wants us to know that this is the victory that destroys Satan. And the reason the church, like a mother will tell a child, you have to eat, because if you don't, you're going to die. If you cut yourself off from, the, from, the, from practicing your Catholic faith, this Jesus here one day will have to say to you, I don't know you, you didn't come to me, you left me. And I beg you, it's the greatest gift to be able to receive a blood transfusion every Sunday from Jesus. And I, the last thing I would say to you, Please, don't ever deny the faith. Don't ever allow anybody, as Father Pablo put beautifully, this is, this is the truth, and the truth sets you free. And if you live in the truth, you will know the power of miracles. You'll know Jesus working in your life. So I really encourage you to do this, and I will, Father Pablo and myself, will pray for you very much, because this is Jesus who's inviting you inviting all of us, come to me. I am the way. There's no other way. I am the truth. There's no other truth. And I am the life. I will give you life. So let's now worship Jesus as we prepare for the final blessing and the song. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. <laughs> Jesus, we love you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> no, I'm going to, to say a word. Uh, beautiful choir uh, sings and praises God with us. I want to first of all thank Father Michael and Father Peter and all the people that I met, all these great bodyguards that I've had, um, Dylan and Francis and all the, the stewards. It's been a wonderful week. I've enjoyed it immensely and especially since I'm from Armagh myself. It's great. My dad was from the city, my grandfather. And I want to say that I promise you that I will pray for you. It was a great, I'm so happy. I'm so happy when we promised Father Michael that we would come. And I want to thank you so much for your, your joy, your faith, and um, for just being among you. It's been a blessing. And I want to ask you to pray for Father Pablo and myself. Now, pray more for me, because I'm much older. <laughs> I mean, 
I look at Father Pablo and I think, God bless him. The Lord sent somebody who's so full of energy and he really likes to go places. And he, we have all these invitations around the world and I'm thinking, oh my God, I don't know if I'll be able. So your prayer can keep going. I mean, I, I'll tell you the truth, I'm 77. Not bad, am I? 77 years of age, you should be getting the pension, retiring. <laughs> And I have to tell you, I love Jesus, and I keep telling him, I'm 63 years, or nearly 64 in the convent. It's the best life. It's the best gift. It would be terrible if I was in it and I didn't know Jesus. But he gets better looking every day, the closer I'm getting to him. And I want to thank you all. I want to thank, there's a friend of mine here all the way from Cork, and out there, for coming all the way on. She's a great friend of mine for many, many years, and I know I have many cousins and all kinds of family friends in this gathering, but you're all, we're all related through Jesus. And I love you all, and please God, I'll see you. Before Father Pablo says a word, let me tell you. We're going to be in Fahard. You know, it's the, it's the 1,500 years of the birth of St. Bridget. I'd say if she came back, she wouldn't believe it. she saw Ireland. So we're praying for a great renewal in the country. And Father Pavel and myself will be there on the, the 16th and the 17th right, of um, August, just before we go to the intercession for priests in Manu. No, the 18th and the 19th. That's because I'm old. I can't remember. Anyway, uh, the 18th and the 19th, but it's on our website, and I'm sure Father... Um, Michael will let you know. So if you can come to Fahard, it's a beautiful. I grew up very close to it, so I'm looking forward to going there. And then on, on the um, bank holiday August weekend, I'm going to be in knock with some of the priests from the intercession for a day, that day, where there's a, an international day for Thanksgiving for the priesthood, and also a beautiful healing service and a holy hour, public holy hour. So if you can come, you're more than welcome. And the last thing I have to do is thank this beautiful choir. They're in the down colours, you know, red and black. <laughs> anyway, this is our man. But I want to, uh, to thank you also, and the little school children, which were beautiful. So I'll let Father Pablo have the final word. But you know, I have to tell you, we have to leave immediately because Father Pablo is flying out like at 7 o'clock in the morning or 8 late earlier he has to be in dublin to fly back to spain to to say goodbye to his mom and dad pick up his stuff and leave for costa rica because he has to be in the jungle for holy week with the indians which they only get very rarely get mass so we we'd love to stay around and uh, talk to you but we're going to have to go and uh, please god we'll meet again and thank you god bless you and here's father Pat. Now, I have to tell you, the first time I came to Ireland, I was looking for the land of St. Patrick, and in the beginning, I got a little bit scared because I was walking through, what's the name of the street again? O'Connell Street. Street. And I was like, oh no, what happened? What happened? Until I saw a spark of light, okay? This was after a parish mission. I was walking O'Connell Street, and all of a sudden, I see 20 travelers, young, and all of a sudden, I'm, I'm just walking normally, and they point at me, and they come to me. I'm like, I'm dead. <laughs> I'm dead. I'm dead. They surround me, and they say, are you the father that was in the parish mission the other day? I'm like, yeah, yeah. The 20 of them knelt down in the middle of O'Connell Street and asked for a blessing. God bless the travelers. God bless them. <laughs> there I said, hmm, there's something interesting about Ireland. Now, it seems there's no fire, but the coal is so warm that once you blow a little bit, it goes boom. 
and it starts again. This is what we have seen these days in this parish. You don't know, you have no idea what the Irish blood is. I see it from here. And I see that you can light the fire in this country more than ever again. We need Ireland. We need you guys to wake up again and start this beauty. It's nothing, it's not all what we're doing. No, no, what are we missing? This is too big. So uh, I would really love to thank you all for the beautiful mission that we just had. And in a very special way, my two brothers, Father Peter and Father Michael. What do you think about these two priests? They're almost as good as me, but <laughs> apart from that, uh, also the deacons, everyone here, I wouldn't stop thanking everyone. So God bless you all. We hope to see you soon. Please pray for us. Uh, I mean, yes, pray more for Sister Bridge, but pray for me, <laughs> please. God bless you all. Thank you so much. <laughs>